Ivan, you good? Okay. Right. So good afternoon, members of the media. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon to our media conference here at our party headquarters, 11 Lord Street here in San Fernando. We want to address a number of issues that came out of the meeting held by the PNM in Point 14 on Thursday evening um, to respond to some issues, but also to put forward um, some important points. First of all, I want to congratulate those MSJ members, uh, one of whom is here with us this afternoon, Nigel White, one of our strong members activists, and other members and activists, um, Ghana Thompson, and, um, and, and probably known as, as Buzz, one of the long-standing members of the Point 14 community, for, and others who came out on that evening to challenge um, the lies of the PNM, the lies of Dr. Rowley, Stuart Young, and Franklin Khan with respect to Petrotrain and the closure of, of Petrotrain. There were many, many lies, so we heard that the government decided to close down the refinery as one, one lie because, of course, it wasn't just a refinery that was closed. All of Petrotrain was closed down and all the workers were sent home. And there were so many false narratives. I'm not going to go into all of them now because we have dealt with that from day one, from, from the end of August when the announcement was first made by SPNA and so on. We have dealt with all those false narratives. But those false narratives were again repeated um, in point 14 as the PNM attempts to fool some of the people in point 14 in order to to, to hold its support base together. And we are well aware that the PNM support base in Point 14 has been broken apart by their actions of closing Petrotrain and so on. So I want to congratulate those MSJ members who came out to challenge the lies. And I want to say that we defend the right of our members and of all citizens to freedom of expression, to go and express their point of view and to challenge um, the positions of the government, especially where those positions are based on a false premise, on a false narrative, or based on a tissue of lies. So we will defend them, and it was very, very unfortunate that the police would step in and seek to remove um, our members from that meeting. Um, they were not disrupting the meeting, they were simply, they were simply responding to, to the lies that were being spouted from the platform by um, the PNM ministers. And we defend the right of our members and citizens generally to express their views in this country and to challenge, challenge the government, whether they speak as government, whether they speak as party and so on, when they are misleading the public and people of Trinidad and Tobago. So that's the first point I want to make this afternoon. Secondly, I um, want to say once again we have said it in the last several media conferences that we have had that the PNM policies with respect to the energy sector, and I'm focusing only on energy, of course, we could challenge um, and condemn many of their other policies, but specifically the PNM policies on energy are policies which we totally oppose um, because the PNM, Dr. Rowley et al., are selling out the national interest of Trinidad and Tobago to the multinational corporations, um, first of all, and also selling out the assets of this country to their cronies and friends and so on. So whether and the one percent and the party financiers. So whether it is amalgamated security who gets a contract for security in Petrotrain and makes a mess of it, which is why you now have um, allegations of theft and other kinds of problems in Petrotrain, um, whether it is um, Frankie Khan's statement about a foreign entity, most likely we get the refinery, or whether it is um, companies like BP and others getting the contract to bring in fuel into Trinidad and Tobago to sell over to Pario, who will then sell it over to NP and so on. All of that is an indication of the fact that the national interest has been sold out, as well as those deals which have remained secret between um, the Prime Minister and senior ministers with the multinational companies like BP and Shell and BHP, which we are not, uh, we don't have the details of, but which we firmly believe have resulted in taxpayers of this country 
and therefore the people of Trinidad and Tobago losing hundreds of millions of US dollars in taxes that ought to have been paid by these multinationals, but which now have been given up in return for some monies coming into the Treasury, which we expect the PNM will use those monies coming into the Treasury to um, buy votes um, when election time comes around through budgets where they will offer some sweeteners to the population. So they are willing, that is the PNM willing to accept some money, which they will then use to try to buy votes and giving back to the multinationals or allowing the multinationals to get away with um, hundreds of millions of US dollars that ought to be paid. And we also think that this is illegal because tax arrangements with respect to individuals or corporations are the purview of the Board of Inland Revenue and so on, um, and in some cases ought to be determined by the Petroleum Prices Committee and not by Prime Minister or Minister of Energy and, and a minority of, of government ministers. That is wrong in law and it is wrong in economics and we want to charge the government that their policies with respect to the energy sector have in effect been um, economic crimes against the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We are charging them once again, as we have said before, with economic crimes when it comes to the management of the energy sector of Trinidad and Tobago. The third point I want to make is now a direct rebuttal to what Dr. Rowley said in point 14 when he thought he needed to attack me personally and so on, when he said that, um, that I resigned he didn't say from what, but he said that I resigned rather than having to be involved in making hard decisions about Petrotrain. So let me first of all say that the only public body from which I resigned was the Economic Development Advisory Board. Um, and when I resigned from the EDAB, which was subsequent to the resignation of the chairman, Dr. Um, Terence Farrell, other members of the EDAB then resigned one after the other and the EDAB then became essentially non-functional. And that had to do with the fact that Dr. Rowley and his government was ignoring, and in some cases treating with great disrespect, the work of the EDAB. That had absolutely nothing to do with Petrotrin, right? The EDAB was in no decision-making responsibility with respect to Petrotrin or anything else. We were advisory, but our advice was not being taken seriously and ignored and treated with disrespect, and that is why I resigned from the EDAM. And I made it public, very, very clear. With respect to the Lashley Committee, I served on the Lashley Committee to the end, and in fact, when the Lashley Committee met with Dr. Rowley to hand in the report, it was only Mr. Lashley who chaired the committee, um, Gregory Marchand, and myself. The two only two representatives and Mr. Lashley who met with the Prime Minister. There were no other members. Espine was out the country, Riley was out the country, and so on, and other members were unavailable. And we met and we completed that work. When we were asked to meet with the Energy Subcommittee of Cabinet, they treated us with disrespect. Mrs. Helen Drayton was present. Um, we waited for two and a half hours, and we then had to, she had to leave. We were kept waiting for two and a half hours or more. And when eventually we went in, it was only Mr. Marchand and myself who went in to meet with the Energy Subcommittee. Mr. Lashley was there in his capacity as Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Energy. And we met with the Prime Minister and the other members of the Energy Subcommittee for about 10 minutes because the PM wanted to go and visit some flood prone, some area that had been flooded out. Um, and so the, we were treated in terms of our report and a discussion of our report as a committee with gross disrespect by the Prime Minister and by other members of the Cabinet. Um, I was never appointed to the board of Petrotrin. I was invited by the Prime Minister to be a member of the board, and I turned down the invitation, and I said so right away, right after the invitation, I made it public, and I've said so on many occasions, and I read out the, the series of text messages. I won't do it again this afternoon, but I read it out in the, to the media, which was a text exchange between the Prime Minister and myself on the 29th of August of um, 2018, and then finally on the 30th of August when I indicated that I would not be accepting the invitation. And it had nothing to do with my not wanting to be part of making a hard decision, but it had to do with a principle of 
making a recommendation as the Lashley Committee, of which I was a member, as to how the board should be appointed going forward, and the board then being appointed um, in contradiction to our recommendation. I could not, in conscience, make a recommendation and then accept a board appointment that was in contradiction to the very recommendation that I made together with other members of the committee, and that is why I did not accept that board appointment. In any case, um, it would not have been me um, not wanting to make hard decisions because I'm not afraid of making hard decisions um, and I've made many decisions including what some people thought was a hard decision to leave the partnership government in 2012. It, that was not a hard decision for me. Some people may think it was a hard decision but I am not afraid of making hard decisions in the, but what I am also clear about is that I will not make any decision that will sell out the interests of Trinidad and Tobago to the multinationals, to, 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 to a few, and sell out the interests of workers, the communities, and the businesses of South Trinidad, as Espine and all the others and Rowley did. By the decision that they took, they sold out the workers, they sold out the interests of businesses in South, they sold out the interests of the communities in South, and I would never have been a part of, of such a decision, um, and, and that is where I stand politically in terms of that. Now, he also said I'm not a politician. Well, let me say that if being a politician is being corrupt, as most politicians in the UNC and the PNM have been over the years, I am not a politician like that. If being a politician is selling out to the 1%, and the financiers who then expect to get a return on their investment by way of contracts, I am sorry, I am not a politician like those politicians of which the parties in parliament represent. If being a politician is getting people to vote for them by appealing to race and religion and so on, I am sorry, I am not a politician that is going to be appealing to vote on the basis of race and religion. If being a politician is to use state power and then abuse it by attacking the interests of workers and poor people and business people and reneging on manifesto promises and so on, then I'm sorry, I'm not that kind of politician, Dr. Rowley, and I will never be that kind of politician like you and your party and Mrs. Prasad Bissessa and her party alike and so on. If being a politician is turning their back on the people who vote for them because the people who vote uh, only count when it comes to counting votes and they don't count outside of that because they are poor people and workers and their interests, they don't have the, the, the air of, of those in power, then I'm sorry, I'm not a politician like that. I'm a different kind of politician um, that stands with the workers, with the people of Trinidad and Tobago in their fight for justice in and out of election season. And that is what the MSG as a political party is, which is why we are a different kind of party, and which is why we say we are the only alternative to what passes for party politics and government in Trinidad and Tobago today. And lastly, Dr. Rowley said, we must meet him in Market Square in Point 14. Well, yes, we are going to meet him in Market Square in Point 14 because the MSJ intends to, to change Point 14 from being the borough of sorrows, which it has been historically over the years under PNM control, to being a borough which the people of Point 14 can truly feel pride in because it is the people in control of the borough are seeking their interests. And so, yes, the MSJ is going to challenge the PNM in Point 14, both in the local elections for the borough and the constituency of Point 14 and in other constituencies. And we feel that the people in Point 14 will respond to us because they know that the PNM has never really served their interest in Point 14 and elsewhere. And perhaps the Prime Minister will want to meet me in his constituency because I go in his constituency more than he goes in his constituency. So come up in Scorpion, Upper Hague Street, come up in Seaview Gardens, come up Lansmita, come up Smith Hill, and so on, and Seaview Road, and the other parts of, of Carinage, which Dr. Rowley, you don't visit, and so on. I go up there just myself and two of our activists and meet people and engage with them. You don't do that. 
because you don't really care about the ordinary poor people of Trinidad and Tobago. All you care about is their votes and the power that it gives to you to then transform Trinidad and Tobago away from the vision that Dr. Williams and Butler and all the others said. And that's another point, because you said Labour has no business in politics, but the first political movements and parties in this country were Labour. The British Empire Citizens and Home Rule Party was Butler's party. Trinidad Labour Party of Captain Cipriani, and we go, could go through many of the others. And it was they that laid the foundation for the modern Trinidad and Tobago. They fought for independence. They fought for self-government. They fought for, for the rights of working people and the poor, for education and health care and all those things, and to create a society based on the principles of social justice and equity and fairness and an end to discrimination. And what Dr. Rowley, you and the PNM are doing is destroying that type of society and creating a society that is in the interest of the few and not the many. And where the MSJ stands is in the tradition of those who fought for and in the interest of the many. And that is what we are about, and that is why we are challenging you in Point Fortin, in Carinage, and elsewhere in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is our statement this afternoon. Thank you. Do you have any ideas that we need to talk about in terms of in light of the fact that the Prime Minister went from the Spirit Ships decision? I have no idea. Um, and I know that um, the ODBQ's President General challenged that issue in a press conference on Friday. And I saw of what we can call a lame response by Mr. Khan uh, by way of a press release. A lame, lame excuse, a lame response. So, no, I have no idea and so on, and he has not satisfied the country with his response, um, but time will tell. Were you surprised that the Prime Minister just uh, mentioned what um, the speech No, I'm not surprised because, you see, there's an old saying, what is it, that you don't pelt a tree that doesn't have good fruit on it, right, mangoes? We're in Julie Mango season now, right? Um, and Zabaka season probably is coming up. Um, so no, I'm not surprised because you see, MSJ is getting traction. We've been saying that and it is getting traction in point and elsewhere. If we were getting no traction and we were of no significance, then he would not respond to us. Yes? But they are worried. The PNM is worried and they have very good reason to be worried in point 14 and in Labre and elsewhere in, in, in Trinidad and so on because of their policies. Any others? Sasha? Ivan, you're quiet. <laughs> Speech, Ivan is speechless this afternoon. All right. Cindy, you're good? OK, well, thank you very much for coming. I'm sure that you will have enough for your news and for the newspapers. Yes? Yes, yeah, sure, Cindy, yes. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry, just, just, just repeat that again, sorry. I wasn't hearing, sorry. Okay, so that, let us deal with the facts as per Heritage and Paria, which are the two companies that are actually operating right now, okay? Um, the fact of the matter is that the majority of the people who had been working in those operational areas as Petrotrain employees did not get employment with those companies, um, Heritage or Paria. And secondly, the terms and conditions of employment by Heritage and Paria in general terms are by labor supply contracts. So it is not Heritage and Paria that have hired them, but a contractor like Kenson and others that have done the hiring. Um, so it is false to say that Heritage and Paria have hired because they have not done the direct hiring. It is by way of a contractor, labor supply, and the terms and conditions 
are a fraction of what workers would have been getting before, 25, 30% of what they've been getting before. And therefore, um, and I've said it before quite publicly, that it would be in the interest of the country and of the workers if the bid by the OW2 was to, if the OW2 was to be awarded the, the, the purchase or lease of the refinery, because that would perhaps be the only situation in which workers would in fact be re-employed under proper terms and conditions of employment. Well, you know, when you add up um, the workers in E&P, exploration production on the Petrotrain, and the workers in the refinery, it was about half and half, right? So it wasn't as if the refinery workers were like 75% of the overall workforce of Petrotrain. It was about half and half. Yeah, Nigel? Yeah, just, just to add to comment, um, scene, is that the workforce is under contracted situation. So as, even though we hear Paria and Heritage, right? They supply, they, they live with contractors uh, under labor contracts. <coughs> so the workers, even though they work in not working with, majority not working with Paria or Heritage, they are either working with um, Progressive, Pricewaterhouse, or um, Kenson. Kenson. It's the same principle might be applied to the refinery, you get some external person. So if an external person come here, what they will do? They may do the same thing. Seek to get somebody to supply manpower labor, right? Give them some contract to supply manpower labor who might have an understanding of the, the, the refinery and pay them a percentage of what they was working for, no terms and conditions. <coughs> so the people who are working right now down there are working for one third the salary was working before. So it's not to say that you do something, you get back higher, and they're making a comparison to make you feel that as citizen, we should only get enough. So you mustn't be able to do anything else. You know, and all of us as citizens must understand that. Whether you're media, whether you're, you're, you're working for a milk tea and tech, whether you're working CPEP, whatever you're working, you have to understand when you go to work, it's not just to get enough, but you want to excel, and the government continues to school light and call it unproductive, lazy, as people, all of us are citizens because they are family, your brothers and sisters work in these places. And the government continue to do that and then come back to you and tell you they're working for you. Right? So they tell you that your salary or your wages is too high. But they, them own not too high, that he can also justify why you should raise the pension. And we had a clap to tell you, yeah, yeah, yeah. because his pension, being over $25,000, is not enough to take care of his medical bills. But the normal person getting $3,000, well, what happened to them? They live in a day when I take a medical bill. And we clap and think as a citizen of Toronto Tobago. And we had to do so, all of us, had to understand when these politicians are playing us. Right? So, with that whole scheme of things and talking about, oh, the people and no matter who own it. If you own your house and you own your house, you manage your house. When you're renting from somebody, you are not control. They can decide to pay their rent whenever they see it fit, and they have to change your contract. So when you talk about no matter who runs it, it's still viable. So you can't tell me somebody is out of Trinidad Tobago running our entity, all of us entity, as sitting at Trinidad Tobago, and it's good for all of us. Because why? And I'll tell our reporter the other day, see security and media people will all time work in this country. You know why? Because I have a lot to report and a lot to defend. You know? Because of the way how things is going. And so some of these people in these fields, you know, may not really see the effects of what's going on. But the government of China Tobago today is going to privatize everything. And they're going to have no terms and conditions to defend whether what limitations either whosoever you work have. Because they're going to take away all their rights. So all you could do is work. Right now in Dung and Heritage and I'm Heritage, you know what I do? To change some of the fellas' conditions at work. They used to work six to six. Let's come on to now. Only working six to six again. Only working five to seven now. I mean seven to five now. Right? So now happening, the money gets smaller again. You know? So automatically they have no control. When you don't have any terms and conditions you operate on, they have no control. Who pays the piper call the chief? Thank you. Yeah. Well said. Okay, which is one question on this you said you will challenge the 
Sorry? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm simply saying that I visit those areas which is in his constituency far more than he does. Just a statement of fact. I, I'm simply saying that because when I go in those areas and other parts of Trinidad and so on um, and Tobago, we hear a common cry by people who are in traditional PNM areas that the PNM is not seeking their interests. People up in St. Barb's, in Lavantil, in Morva, in other places I go, the PNM is not seeking and has never sought the interests of ordinary working people and poor people in the constituencies that the PNM traditionally has won over the years, okay? And this is why I'm saying that um, people are saying to us as the MSJ, we would like you, Mr. MSJ, um, to, to represent us. And we have been helping people in those communities, not about votes, but we have been actively helping people in those communities around problems that they have, yes? Um, and, and so, so they recognize that this is not just about elections and votes, it's about our working with the communities, listening to people, working with them, and fighting for justice all the time. That's what we're about. Yeah? When, when nomination day comes, we'll find all of that out, Cindy. <laughs> all right? We'll find that out. Thank you very much.